He's like, hey, turn them shits up. Turn it turn up. Turn them shits up. I, I can't hear myself. I can't hear my headphones. Turn them shits up. And we're back. Episode number three. Appreciate everybody who watched episode one and episode two on ESPN 97.5 Houston on the YouTube channel. This is Athletically Declined Sports Show. Man, uh, football was back. Last episode, we talked about that. Spence, what are we going to get into today? Uh, today, we are going to be getting into our hottest Houston sports takes, one for mm. each team. But before we do that, we'll be introducing a brand new segment that we'll be doing every single week here on ESPN Houston Jet, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So this is something I'm going to give some credit to our boy, Mr. James West. By the way, if you guys are not following James, you need to make sure at, at James West Sports, I believe, or I believe that's what it is. We'll put it on the screen. We'll put it on the screen here um, because James has two accounts, um, and I never know which <laughs> which one. Uh, He's got is one correct. for business and one for yes sports for sports. Um, but James is giving always giving picks, and that he is, in my opinion, in I'm sure you're going to agree with me here. He's a college football guy. Oh, he yeah. He is Mr. College Football, but always given really good sports betting, um, you know, parlays, teasers, you name it. James is all in on it, and he's giving you those every single time there is an opportunity to bet. So you want to check that out. But me and James came up with uh, the concept that we later realized was going to, at some point, be a part of a show, and it is called Respectfully Biased because everybody – respectfully has a respectfully biased sports take because it is yours and you have the right to your sports take however we also have the right to tell you you're wrong and why or that you're right and why respectfully respectfully so res respectfully yeah, as you guys can tell, really lean on the respectfully. That is uh, an AD inside joke. Maybe some at some point we'll explain yeah. the heritage of that. But um, before we get going, guys, as always, we are here at the Sanctuary in Friendswood. You guys, make sure you come check out Sanctuary. Open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can come in here and reach all of your fitness goals. Um, our boys out here are always taking care of you. Cole Mason at the front, the nicest human beings you will, will meet. I mean, you walk in, you're immediately, you have a bad day and your day's going to be a little bit better. Great staff here um, doing a great job. And as you guys can see, I'm rocking a new Throad Limited Drop. Got the got the Throad Cherry. You guys can check them out and find all the latest drops on our boys. Sold out, S-O-L-E-D, out, F-T-X dot com, where you guys can get your sneakers and all of your apparel needs. Uh, for any of those niche Houston brands, you can find them there and also find uh, Throad on Instagram where you can keep up with all those drops. Um, I'm missing anything. I think that's it. I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay. So, respectfully biased. Here's the introduction. We have a treat for you guys because we got our boy, Clancy, sending one in. And let's see what Clancy has to say on the inaugural Respectfully Biased segment. All right, boys. Clancy here. Hot take. This is going to be the lowest watched Super Bowl in history this year. Super Bowl 59 is going to draw historically low numbers because it's going to be a matchup we've seen twice already. It's going to be the Chiefs again. It's going to be the Niners again. No team coming out of the NFC can keep pace with San Francisco. I like to think last week proved that, even without CMC. The Lions are probably the closest contender, punch for punch. Niners have it, not close. The AFC, it's the Chiefs, the Ravens, and believe it or not, the Texans. It's just at this point, it's going to come down to experience. So Mahomes, Andy Reid, already beat the Ravens once without Hollywood Brown. When it comes down to it, we're going to get another matchup of the Chiefs and the Niners. It may be really good football, but people are tired of the matchup. Fewest watched Super Bowl in history. Okay. Wow. Very, very spicy. Very, very spicy. After week one, we're putting the Chiefs and the 49ers back in the Super Bowl. Um, so I don't think that's crazy. I don't think it's crazy because, he, like he said, 
what we saw from week one, the Chiefs looked very, very good against a very good Ravens defense. Those new weapons for Pat Mahomes, those look scary, right? Defense going to show up in the playoffs like they always do. 49ers side, they looked great on Monday night. Um, Home game, Monday night football, doesn't matter. No Christian McCaffrey. They get it done anyways, and they look very, very good. There's one small problem, one pretty big oversight with what our boy Clancy suggested. And I it's, think I know where you're going with it's it. It's the fact that there is no way this will be the lowest watched Super Bowl Hell if my. these two teams rematch because the Swifties will never, ever let that happen. If there is any TV that Taylor Swift is going to be on, those Swifties... They're going to be locked and loaded. They're going to be staring at the screen, waiting for just that five-second glimpse of their girl in the press box. They're going to be waiting for that. There is no chance. There is no chance that is the least-watched Super Bowl of all time. It might be the second highest. It might not pass last year's because of the reasons Clancy said, but the Swifties will not allow it to be the lowest-rated Super Bowl of all time. It's just impossible. Yeah, I I don't think it's going... Respectfully. Respectfully, I don't think it's going to be either. And I'm going to say, give, I like your reasons uh, to piggyback off of what you said. It's an off the field reason, I know, but. But it's still, it's relevant. I think that the Swifties, number one, but even deeper, I think this would be the second Super Bowl that Taylor Swift would be a part of. They've been dating a while. I think last year there there was a massive expectation that Travis Kelsey, if they won, was going to propose. I think that that like thought grows even more. And because of that, that would be a reason. But another reason, too, is we have what some would say the king of rap right now. Kendrick Lamar is your halftime show. And I think that is a very underrated part there. I think a lot of people are going to watch it. Oh, millions upon millions millions of people are going to tune in to Barry Drake. 150%, 150%, bro. The whole nation going to be, they not like us. They not, they like, not us. like us. They not like us. Yeah. And also, too, let's put the brakes on the 49ers. And I'm really? an outlier here, I'm sure. You went on Monday night with a bad Jets defense that we know is not that bad. We know that, that they're not that bad. Run-wise, the bad, Jets. Bad defense, not that bad. Got it. Yeah. It's the first game. I got it. You've got Aaron Rodgers, who did not play one preseason game. He is figuring out there something Chris. I'm I'm not a massive Chris Sims fan anymore when it comes to quarterback stuff, but something did point out. There were throws where Rodgers wasn't really able to put a lot of weight on his foot. Like you could tell at times that Rodgers was still getting used to the injured foot being out there in game speed. And so I think this team's going to be a lot better as the season goes on. So I don't think that's like, this is who they are. And also, too, CMC, that's going to be a problem if he continues to miss games. Like, we don't really know the extent of the injury like we thought we did, I think. And will he come back? Yes, I think CMC is going to come back. But how healthy is he? Are they forcing him back? And can Mason continue to carry the load? I mean, I don't think he's going to rush for 150 yards every game. Like, if he does, great. And guess what? Then the 49ers are just going to be dominant in the run game again. But I don't know. I just, something about the 49ers, they're a good football team. But it's kind of, to me, some similarities with the Bills. They just don't scare me like they did. That's my reason. And on the same time, the Texans team is very good. It's a very good Houston Texans team. I would go as far as to say when that team continues to like push forward and really opens things up to all the weapons they have, and that defense is only going to get better as they continue to gel, that's also going to be a big problem for those guys. I, and and I've got a lot of stock in, in the Lions. I just do. You know my 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 infatuation with the Lions and with uh Excuse me, with Jared Goff and with Amon Ross St. Brown and Gibbs and with uh, Jack Campbell and Brian Branch and everything they got going on there with Hutchinson. Like, that's a very good team in the NFC. And also, the Cowboys are still there. And I think as long as Dak and CD is healthy, they still have a shot to still make noise. Are they going to close? I don't know. You tell me, Dallas. But... I don't know. To say it's going to be the lowest rated Super Bowl, I think that's nonsense in the age where, as you rightfully said, 
more off the field things are almost dictating the viewership than the on the field. That's the on the field is what you're going there for. You're staying for the deeper storylines. That's right. That's right. Every year, that's how it is. Respectfully. 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 Cool. Well, speaking of, you brought up the Texans there at the end. I think this is a good way to segue into our hot Houston takes here at the end of September. Well, middle of September. Sizzling. That's right. So we're going to give each of y'all, we're going to give all of y'all each of our own hot takes about the Texans, Astros, and Rockets. Should we start with the Texans? Start with the Texans. All right. I'll go ahead and I'll lead it off. I believe, despite having the lowest receiving total of the trio in week one, Tank Dell, Nathaniel, U of H product, I believe he will end the year as the Texans' leading wide receiver in yards. Touchdowns, I'm convinced right now it's probably going to be Stephon Diggs, but yards, I'm still in on Tank Dell. I know he's not on the field in two wide receiver sets. I get that, but we're only a matter of time before he forces the hand and he has to be on the field more. Because let's face it, as great as Stephon Diggs is, as great as he is and as great as he looked in week one, I still have reservations that he is going to be that same guy all the way through the year. We saw mm -hmm. what happened last year, right? Tank Dell, we saw how great he was playing all last year, and we didn't get the full glimpse of what he could be yeah. because of the injury that happened in the Jacksonville 100%. game. If we get a full year of Tank Dell, and honestly, the fact that he's not on the field in two wide sets, I think that might actually be even be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Keeps him healthy, keeps him fresh. I still think Tank Dell is going to be your leading receiver for the Texans at the end of the year. That Stroud Tank Dell chemistry is unrivaled. I know him and Nico got it good, and Nico Collins might actually be a top 10 wide receiver, but the more and more he starts to enter that upper echelon yeah. of elite wide receiver play, the more there's going to be defensive tension thrown his way. They're going to start doubling him up top with a safety. Tank Dell is going to be, you know, I think him and Diggs will split time in the slot. Sure. That's kind of how it was on Sunday. But rest assured, Tank Dell, single coverage, you have no chance. Yeah, and I, and I love that take. I think, uh, I mean, you're gonna you're seeing him like get used in different ways. Mm -hmm. And man, that would I be love the only that. thing that would put that would maybe you know kind of go against my take is the fact that he is gonna have a lot of rushing yards. I think they're gonna give him some jet sweeps. He looked good, and I think I wouldn't. I'll say this too. I think we might see it if we're coming down the stretch at the end of the year. I'm gonna plant this seed now. If we're coming down the stretch at the end of the year, we might see a lot more Tank Dell reverses, try to get him some speed going towards the edge. I don't think we're ever going to see him used as a Debo, full like hand the ball off to him in the yeah. backfield, but we're going to start seeing him be a very much more like a Percy Harvin than I think we anticipated him coming out of U of H. I think he's going to be that for the Texans offense when we get down to the end of the season. Yeah, I think, you know, going to your take, talking about, you know, Stephon Diggs on the touchdowns, I, I think when it comes down to it, like when you know a guy is like m the consistency of I, I'm i throwing him the ball, like that's our best shot of like catching it of the three in the end zone, it, it's hard not to get a guy like that the ball, right? Like it's hard not to target him. That's why we've seen him with volume so many time after time, like, excuse me, season after season when he was with Buffalo and when he was the lone receiver out there with the Vikings, uh, when he was, when he was originally drafted the Vikings. Um, yeah. I mean, I love the take. I like Tank Dill. I think he's on my fantasy team, man. Um, I got high hopes, but for me, I'm going to go a little bit different. I'm going to go a little different route. I think that when the season's all said and done, the number one running back is not going to be CMC, and it's not going to be Brees Hall. It's going to be Joe Mixon. Wow. I think Joe Mixon is going to end the year as the number one running back in the National Football League. Okay, and in, he will, in terms of? He will lead the league in rushing yards, and he will lead the league in touchdowns. And I am going to even go out on a limb and say he will also lead the league in all-purpose yards as a running back. All right. That is very, very spicy. Um, because here's the thing. Wow. If you go and look at all the – and again, it, we're talking overreactions from week one. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. But if you look at all those running backs that went over 100 yards, and I'll even say over 120 yards – of those running backs, which one of those do you think is actually sustainable to average 110 yards a game? I think that's fair. Joe Mixon, over his career, has had an extremely good bill of health. 
And what has did Joe Mixon? And again, we understand like recency bias, being on the team, hyping your boys up. But what did he say? What did he say, Spence, on that press? He loves how he's being used here in Houston. He said, getting utilized correctly. Yep. And what do we know about Bobby Slowick? He's a freaking genius yep. when it comes to this and, offensive Enjoy him team. while he's here, Houston. He is gone after this season. As long as you keep Keon Green, keep Tunsil, keep all these guys healthy, and that line, and it continues to look the way that you say, we— You said Keon Green? It's Kenyon Green. Did I say Keon yeah. Green? It wouldn't be an episode of Athletically Declined without Jet Boyer messing up a name. That is true. But as long as, as this line stays as good as what it was as far as health, and, and I understand, like, in the National Football League, that is that is a tall task. Your uh, What is it? Your best qualities, your availability? Mm -hmm. And I stand by it because I, I am truly buying in now that CMC is going to be gone a longer, and I think that's really... Between CMC and Brees, those are his only competition, in my opinion. Man, I well, through week one, he's definitely pacing for it. Uh, maybe Devon Achan might have a bit to say. He had 100 yards in, in week one, I he, believe. He did. Um, I just, you know, my, you know my concern with Achan. With any of the Miami running backs, it's yeah. always health. Like, yeah. I just feel like they always, like. I'm trying to think of some other names I think could threaten it. Um, I mean Gibbs, but even still, we saw well, how Barkley maybe Barkley is Barkley one should be in that conversation, especially touchdowns. He's already two ahead of of uh, of Mixon there. Yeah. But I I I I don't hate it though. I mean, obviously, as a Texas fan, I I love it. Yeah. So I would love for that to come true. Um, as far as like it being crazy, I don't think it's insane for the yardage part. I think I think it's a bit crazy to say the leading in touchdowns. Um, because I think CJ Stroud's gonna throw for a lot also. For sure. But I, I love the I love that he I definitely could see him winning the rushing title. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Josh Jacobs won it a few years ago. You know, like it's not on a, always, ba on a bad team. Yeah, it's not always the household names that win like the rushing title. I, I could definitely did, see Joe Mixon pulling it off. You did not even see a line anywhere close to as good as this line. And when he, with the Raiders, mm -hmm. and he did it. So, I don't know, man. I just I got a good feeling about Mixon. I think Mixon is explosive, and he's he's got. You know how I am about momentum. The momentum on his side is the chip of. Let me let me show you guys why you should have resigned me because you're already feeling after week one. Bengals, yikes, eee, yikes. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the Rockets. Who in Eme we trust? Okay, let me go first on this. Go one. ahead, go ahead. So for me. This is going to be a big year. It's a big year. A lot of anticipation. I'm going to say this year's Houston Rockets, led by Shingoon, led by Jabari Smith, Van Fleet, and Green. As I was going to say, you didn't mention Jalen Green. And is that what the hot take's going to be here? I am going to say that, first of all, oh, man, I'm just about to make it real spicy. Oh, my God. I think... The Houston Rockets are not only going to make the playoffs this year. But okay, we they, like that. But they are going to make it into round two. Wow. And I think at the deadline, they will make a trade for a solidified veteran superstar. And the person that is packaged in that is going to be Jalen Green. All right. Wow. Okay. Do you want to speculate on any names? Um, so we talked about it a little bit, um, on air with Killer Bees when, with Brennan and Joel, when we were talking about, uh, when, when we were, when we were at the, uh, excuse me, the rock, the mic, and I'm going to stay, stand true to that. I think it's going to be Butler. Yeah. I like the Tomball kid, dude. Give me some yimmy buckets. I think it's the right time. I think it's the right player, and I think it brings the right amount of grit, emotion, and play that this team needs. It's Jimmy's at a point in his career where he wants a ring, and we have seen that he can single-handedly bring a team that has no business going to the finals, and he can carry them there. What better when you have a team that you don't have to carry and you can be you? And on top of that, you got Ime. Who, by the way, this is a side note, but um, if I remember correctly, uh, Kerr is stepping down USA Basketball, correct? He, I believe he stepped down, and he will, he will not be coaching in L.A. next year. I'm almost positive 
that uh, fact check me real quick, Spence, but I'm almost positive that he said he would not be coaching and that Spolstra would be on that staff. No, you're right. Yeah. Either Spolstra or Tyron Lou. Okay. This happened like a month ago. Correct. Okay. Ime Adoka will be on that staff. Okay. Ime Adoka will be on that USA staff. I think he was around the team in some capacity. He was around the team, and I am going to say that he's going to be a main piece into that staff All right. for Team USA basketball. I would love to see that. Yeah. So, all right. So we're trading for Jimmy Buckets at the deadline, and then we're rolling into the second round of the Western Conference playoffs. Wow. From there, I'm not I'm not making anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, th- that's, plenty, that. hey, that's plenty spicy. I don't think we need any more mm-hmm. spice. I think for your hot take to happen, my hot take is going to have to happen as well. Please indulge So me. my hot take, I'm a very, very big fan of the young core that the Rockets have assembled. Yes. I love the additions that they've made over the years, building around Shingun, mm-hmm. building around Jalen Green. You add um, Amon Thompson last year. Reed Shepard, I expect to really fill that shooter's need. Cam Whitmore, I think the sky's the limit oh, for him. Dude, we loved Cam Tari Whitmore. Tari Eason's got that junkyard dog. He Bro. was made to play for Ime Udoka. But of all of the young core, the one man I left out is the one I think in 2024, 2025 is going to take the biggest leap of all the young core. And I'm including Amon Thompson. I'm including Amon Thompson. I love Amon Thompson. I think he's going to take a big leap forward as well. Tell him who it is. But even bigger than that is going to be Jabari Smith Jr. Yes. I think Jabari Smith Jr., when he was coming out of that draft class, he was my top prospect. My my favorite prospect in that draft. Maybe since then, that might have not aged well. Paulo Bancaro's very special. Chet Holmgren Mm -hmm. is holding it down in OKC. Nonetheless, I think Jabari Smith has finally... Like at last year, he took a massive step forward from his rookie to his sophomore year. He got the shot figured out. He was stroking it, pause from long range. And I think this year he takes a bigger step. I think he's going to get bigger. And I think he was going to be able to bang down low yep. with those bigs in the NBA. Pause again. And then he's also going to be able to finish at the rim more. This that was episode something- of Politically Fine <laughs> Sports segment is brought to you by Blue Chew. No, okay. I'm just kidding. No, it's not. <laughs> Psych. I also think Jabari Smith, one thing he's also struggled with a lot throughout his career to start is finishing around the basket. Mm-hmm. And I think he's going to lock in this summer. I think he's been in the gym. And I want to think that he's working on that. But I also think so, too, that he's going to take more of a... He's going to take more of a, not necessarily the offense will be run through him. We know it'll be run through Shingun, mm-hmm. but I think we're going to see a lot more isolation plays for Jabari Smith in the mid range because yeah. his mid range turnaround is very, very, very good. It is why some people drew comparisons. And, and to me, this wasn't a good comparison if you watched him at Auburn, but some people were comparing his shooting ability in the mid range to what Kevin Durant does. Again, mm-hmm. I don't like that comparison, but there was people making yeah, that comparison. I remember. And it's easy, too, because he's a very tall, Archetype. lanky, you know, wing player mm-hmm. that can defend very one through four, one through five, and shoot from anywhere in the gym, right? Yep. That's why he got those comparisons. I don't personally like it, but nonetheless, I think Jabari Smith takes a big leap forward. I think we see him average a double-double, and I even think think this. I could see that double-double even being... A 18, 19, I, I really want to say he's going to average 20 points a game. I want to say it's so bad. But realistically, I think the offense will be run so much through Shingun, through Jabari, or I'm sorry, through Jalen Green, that I think we're going to see Jabari Smith chip in a very efficient, very efficient 18 points a game with 10, maybe 11 rebounds. But we're going to take, we're going to see Jabari Smith take a massive leap forward in the 24 25 season. I love that. Me and you both are on record how much we love Jabari. And- love Jabari. He is going to be such an important piece for this team if they are going to contend. He's not going to be their best player ever. I don't think that's what Jabari is, but him taking a big leap forward in those areas of his game I laid out, that is going to be what takes the, te- the Rockets to the next level. Yeah. I, I look at him as being the perfect sidekick if you will, to whatever superstar gets brought in. Um, and I say that Shingun has shown that he has the ability to be the primary option in this team. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you, you're giving you're coming with some hot takes. I got one Ooh. for you right now. Bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. The only thing missing from getting Jabari Smith on Draymond Green's level is the rings. If we're talking just the player. I actually think I actually think if we're just talking about the players, separate the accolades. 
If we're just talking about the player, I think Jabari Smith is going to end up being better than Draymond Green. Wow. Just as a player, I think he, I think maybe not as, you know, gritty down low, but I think he has length enough to be as good of a defender if he can continue to develop. And we know his shot is already light years better than anything Draymond Green's ever given us. Yeah. I think Jabari Smith could be an upgraded version of Draymond for a Rockets team that is contending in the future. I, I don't hate that. I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and say that I fully agree with that. But well, you also know how much I hate Dream on Green. I know you do. But I, I think that's to me, in my mind, that's kind of that's not giving him the full respect of the complete how complete his game looks compared to uh Draymond. If if you remember a lot a lot of the comparisons we've had this conversation with Jalen Green specifically, I have compared him to Zach Levine. That's who I've looked at him as. So if we're going to look at like Jalen Green is more of like a Zach Levine than he is like on a James Harden ISO ball guy type level, I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at Jabari's. I think Jabari's ceiling is being the Zach Levine version of a Kevin Durant archetype. Does that make sense? I know I'm getting super deaf. He's the Zach Levine of Kevin Durant. Because, <laughs> be, be, because I believe Zach Levine is a guy. Jabari Smith is the Zach Levine of Kevin Durant. Yeah. I actually I actually love that. But because, I like that. Because Zach Levine is a guy that's like he goes to it, he goes to the Bulls. Like in and even when he was up, he was on the the oh my gosh, the Wolves, the T Wolves, right? Before no. Where was Zach Levine before he was with the Bulls? He was T-Wolves, yeah. He was T-Wolves, okay. Yeah. I think that Zach Levine got got to a point to where he would do some of the things like that Jalen would do where he would pop off for like a handful of games where he, he dropped 40, he dropped 30. He looked like the main guy, and then he'd just go quiet. But he had the ability to do so enough to where you wanted to keep him on the team, but you knew that could be your primary guy. Yeah. And I feel like that's the same thing with what you're saying with Jabari. Jabari is everything you want in that archetype, but he's not Kevin Durant. He's just like that step down from that. If you want to call it a Walmart version of Kevin Durant, I think that's still kind of undermining his ability. That's why I like the Zach Levine of Kevin Durant's. That's where I'm sticking with them. Javari Smith is the Zach Levine of Kevin Durant. But my question to you is, if you have, because I believe that the, the that the Rockets look at, and again, my opinion, they look at Jabari a little bit higher than I think they look at, like, as far as what he can turn into, than Jalen. I think Jalen's in his ceiling. That's my opinion. You guys can take that with what you want. I don't think Jalen Green's going to get any better than what we've seen him. because And, and honestly... I don't think this system is built to be able to utilize what he's really good at, in my opinion, sustain-wise. Do you feel like if if it comes down between Jalen Green and Shingoon in a trade that they are going to take the Jalen Green trade route? Uh, I, to me, you have to build around Shingoon instead of Jalen Green. I, agree. I think he's the better player. And I think, to me, the only reason they didn't pay Shingoon up front is because they are planning to make moves next offseason. Yeah. Um, in for agency when you can use the bird rights to re-sign Shingoon and go over the cap. Right. Um, it makes more sense to do it that way. Look at what the Philadelphia 76ers just yep. did with Tyrese Maxey. Yep. Very similar setup. So um I I think that's I think that's gonna be the key. That's gonna be the key. Yeah, and and also too, like again, I understand, please don't come for me in the comments, but like I have PTSD of looking at a lesser version of what James Harden offered the Rockets. I just do. And forgive me if that keeps me pigeonholed into not seeing the fullness of Jalen Green and what he can be in this system. But I I don't know. I just, I don't, that's the one person where I feel like that I don't feel the full buy-in to the Ime Doka system and culture that I do these other guys. Correct me if I'm wrong. It just feels like Jabari and Shingoon and... Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump. Jalen Green had the players only vacation where he had all of them go out to that gym and they were running fives and it looked like a lot of lot of our players and that was Jalen Green calling. That. Okay, so and I it, definitely think he is. He's definitely a very vocal part of this team and he's going to be an important part of this team at least in 2024 25 unless like you said they they ship him out for a Jimmy, Buck, Jimmy Buckets type. If you sell high on that on him, like if he comes out and kind of has a, a slow start and then hits like a run around like trade deadline, 
that's going to be real hard to like yeah. not field offers. And in I my think, opinion. and there's there's here's the thing: the reality that all Rockets fan, I think we kind of know in the back of our head, yeah. it's coming. We have to consolidate some of these guys because you cannot pay all of these guys if they all hit their ceilings. You can't pay them all anyways. No. But I don't think all of them will hit their ceilings. I think we're all very optimistic about each one, and I can see the path for each one of this core six to being a, an extremely important part of a Rockets team that is contending in the future. But that being said, I don't know which ones exactly are. I think we all have like our different list, and I think every single Rockets fan would rank that core six in a different order. The first two is probably usually going to be either Shin Goon and Jalen Green, but there's going to be people that will tell you Almond Thompson is going to be the truth this year. There's going to be people that will tell you that Reed Shepard yeah. is going to take the world over with his shooting. So a and, lot of exciting things to be looking forward to for this Rocket season. And also the reality the situation is this isn't like this isn't Golden State. Like you're not going to have like your core guys just completely just all thrive right there. In, in Why this not? I just don't believe these are the type that this team has. Let's see how to say this. With what they're trying to do, I don't believe that the guys that are there are going to be able to reach their full potential in this system. Right. And, and the reason I say that is because I think this is more of a early years Thunder made team where you're going to have one of the guys leave. Jalen Green may leave in because if you're if you're Miami and you're trying to make that trade, I would rather take Jimmy, trade him for a guy like Jalen to come in and, and you kind of pick up what you lost. I think Jalen Green would be a great fit in Miami, just the culture. He seems like a Miami guy, honestly. I, I, I agree. And again, nothing against Jalen personally. We're just talking GM talk here yeah. at this point. But I would love for Jalen Green to play like he did in March for the entire season. He, when I, I sure. said it often, that March version of Jalen Green was one of the best basketball yeah. players I've ever seen in my life. And to end this segment, because I know we're kind of stretching this one out a little bit, let me ask you just real quick, if you could go back and went back in time and the Rockets actually had that first pick that we felt like we were supposed to get when it was between Cade Cunningham and uh, Jalen, are you still taking Jalen? Uh, I'm unlike a lot of Rockets fans. I would rather take Cade. I don't have Cade. I would rather have Cade as well. Yeah. Sorry, I just I had to ask the question. No, I I, I love Cade Cunningham. I do too. I think Jalen Green's got a great bag, player. by the and way. I, I won't even lie. Like I've I've probably come around on this part of it, but I was a Mobley guy. Really? I was Mobley mob. Wow. Okay. I that respect definitely it. don't come for me. I know that was a very heated debate. Yes, it on was. X during that draft season. It was Mobley mob, and it was Green Gang. Mm -hmm. I was Mobley mob. Okay. So well, I don't know. You know some other people that are there's some heated debate in and that is with what's going on with our Houston Astros right now so got I believe three weeks until the postseason I believe as time of reporting so let me ask you this question what is your hottest take for the Houston Astros yeah my hottest take I'm gonna go back to one that I had in the preseason and you can go to athletically decline go back to our MLB preview back in March for this, but it didn't look good for a little bit, but I'm bringing it back because it's now looking good. I believe the Houston Astros will make the ALCS once again. They will win the American League pennant once again, where they will go to the World Series and they will get a rematch with the Philadelphia Phillies. However, they'd come up short this time and the Phillies and Bryce Harper wow. get their first ever championship at the Astros' expense. And Bregman goes out Ow. losing in the World Series. Okay. Just like Correa. That kind of hurt a little bit. My heart hurt a little bit. But Same. That's my that's my feeling. I think Bryce Harper is such a great player all time in the MLB. Yeah. And people don't realize it, but when you really look at Bryce Harper's numbers, they're up there. They really are up there. And I think he has he's he's a player that really needs to get a championship to go down as truly one of the greatest baseball players of all time, I think 24 is his year. You didn't ask for this hot take, but I'm going to give you a little bonus. Bryce Harper's better than Mike Trout all time. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think that's mm-hmm. I don't think that's crazy. We've actually seen Bryce Harper perform in the postseason. Yes, we have. Oh, that's not Mike Trout's fault, though. He never gets a chance to get there because the Angels suck. But we digress. The yeah. Phillies, the Astros, that is your 24 World Series. But the Phillies win. And I'll I'll get I'll give you Phillies in six. Yeah. It hurts, but I could see it. I'm con- I think the biggest question mark on any Astros fan is what does this freaking postseason rotation look like? And we'll talk about that more when we get closer to it. But I will touch a little bit on it because my hot take for this year's Astros team at this point is that you're having all these questions and you think Valdez is going to be your ace. You're wondering if, you know, is Hunter Brown going to be able to come and and be the X factor or is Verlander even going to make the roster? What you need to keep your eye on is remember that there was a move made for Mr. Kikuchi. Mm. And I think that we are all sitting here wondering about certain guys, what they're going to do, and he just gets lost in the shuffle. Now, mind you, postseason experience-wise, Kikuchi has only pitched a little over an inning, okay? That was last year, uh, Toronto and the wild card against uh, the Twins, where they would fall 0-2. He pitched right after Barrios. Uh, like I said, a little over an uh, inning, and he had three hits for one earned run. Uh, his ERA for the postseason ended at, I believe, a 5-4. You may look at that and go, well, that's not very impressive. What are you talking about, Jet? Remember what the Astros do. The Astros fix pitchers. Kikuchi came in here, and people had question marks, and he's pitched pretty well. And I think going into this, you're going to feel the momentum. And that's something I feel like the Astros kind of always do is this team, we we are surpassed, oh man, like, are we going to end the season like winning the division? We're beyond that, I feel like. We're in like that Giants territory of of the early or the, the two, 2010s where it's how, like we're gearing up at this time for the playoffs and that's where the mind's at. And whether we end up continue to win out, which is what we're hoping is going to happen, um, four and a half games up on the Mariners and the division at the time of recording, I think momentum's going to shift as I feel like it typically does with the Astros. And I believe that we are going to feel that once postseason baseball hits. And I think Kikuchi is going to end up being your horse you're riding and everyone's going to be going, wow. Dana actually made a pretty dang good move for this postseason. Uh, that's what I think. And I think that you're going to end up having Valdez, whether he starts as the number one, the game one or game two, I don't really think it matters. Kikuchi is going to be the one where you look at and go, that's who I want in a game deci- deciding a game for the postseason this year. It's going to be Kikuchi. Wow. I think for mine to happen, I think, Think yours would have to happen. Also, um, I, I I'll say this: I was definitely critical of the Kikuchi mm-hmm. trade at the time. Were. Well, I, there was definitely it was definitely a very split down the middle. Some Astros fans liked it, some didn't. Um, I, I'll tell you this: my criticism of it had nothing to do with Loperfito. I think he was overrated by a lot of Astros fans. A lot of strikeouts. Yeah, I, I, he has gotten a little bit better. The the numbers are starting to trend up a little mm-hmm. bit more. He's still young. We don't know what he's going to be. Whatever. I don't see like some superstar in Loperfito. Sure. That's not my problem. My problem with it always was he is a pending free agent this winter. So, I I if he if he is the ace that you are saying he's going to be He's going to command a lot of money on the open market. Now, I know the Astros have a lot of money coming off the books this year as well. Nonetheless, do we really want to pay Yusei Kikuchi, who, all things considered, as great as he has pitched for the Astros, you have to account for the fact that he has been up and down his yeah. entire career. Sure. Seattle, Toronto, he's never been fully consistent for like an entire season. So I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the thought of giving him... Three years, forty-five million, something like that. That that sketches me out a bit. Do you think we have to though? Do you think well, because of that? Well, trend? hang on. Before that, back up. If he pitches well in the postseason and he gives me a month of legendary pitching and he gets us to a World Series, he gets us a pennant. I ain't mad about it. He can walk, go get his payday, go pitch for the freaking Orioles or some other yeah. team that's going to pay you a bag this winter that needs pitching. 
fine. You did your job. I'm cool with that. The trade is a success if we can get a pennant out of it. But if you don't get a pennant out of it and he walks, or worse, you give him a contract that ends up looking like a Rafael Montero contract. You know, a guy that has one good season for you in your uniform and you give him a long-term contract and it burns you in your face. I, I'm just saying, that was my criticism of the trade, but it all is washed if he can come in the playoffs and just ball out. Give me Kikuchi to be the Charlie Morton of this of this postseason. That would be pretty sick. Because another guy up and down, dealing with injuries. I just think the Astros have... People forget like the type of pitching that has come in here where it's been like, what is this guy going to do? It's up and down. It's a project. How's Houston? Whatever. And they do it. And then they leave here and they don't like pitch as well. I mean, example, go look. I mean, Garrett Cole, for all, you know, intents and purposes, has not looked the same as he did in an Astros uniform since he's left. Wrong? That's fair. So, again, I just, that's that's what my gut's telling me. And you got a lot, I mean, you have a lot of options. There's, there's a lot of guys that are going to be available in uh, free agency, which that's not what we're talking about. But you are going to have some options. But, yeah, I think if he does that, it's going to be hard not to pay him. It is going to be hard. But, I mean, I, respectfully, I don't think that's, Dana really cares about that. I mean, good Lord. I mean, it's taken, it feels like the guys that should be getting paid, in our mind at least, he's, not really poning up yet. And that's that's its own conversation for another episode. Yeah, maybe next week. Maybe next week. You never know if we're feeling like it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so Spence, moving, uh, moving into this week, what are you looking forward to most as a Houston sports fan right now as we sit of the three teams? Which uh, team am I most excited for right now? Their future, Texans. For the yeah, for this year. It's recency bias. We're in the Texans. middle of the Texans season. Okay. I think it's Texans. And again, I'm for me, I'm really excited about the Texans, but there's just something about the Rockets, man. I'm really excited. I'm excited for the first time in a long time to yeah. talk basketball. Yeah. And it, I don't know, it just gets me fired up. The EMA effect has not worn off for me. But hey, we'll get into plenty of that. And uh, you know, as always, we'll be doing our Astros postseason uh game recap at the end of every postseason game here on Athletically Decline. Hopefully we have a lot of them. Hopefully a lot of them. Uh, could be here on uh, ESPN uh, Houston. We'll see. But uh, yeah, guys, uh, this has been another great episode. It's been a good topic. I love it. I love giving hot takes. That's my favorite. So guys, make sure if you haven't, uh, by by time this goes up, we will have already had Three Man Rush um, recorded and up. So y'all check that out on the Athletically Declined uh, YouTube channel. And if you aren't subscribed to that, please make sure you go subscribe to the Athletically Declined YouTube channel. That really helps us out. Uh, go, sub go make sure you're following us on Instagram at Athletically Declined and on our TikTok at Athletically Declined as well. And we do have an X that we are becoming more and more, in, uh, I guess, active on uh I've been firing some stuff out there myself. Um, so check that out at, at, at Athletic Decline. But yeah, appreciate all you guys. We appreciate y'all hanging out with us. We hope you've been enjoying it. And please leave comments, likes. Let us know that you like the content or you don't. And please don't forget to leave your biggest hot takes for the three Houston teams at the bottom. And hey, maybe maybe you're wanting to hear a little, little MLS. You want to talk about uh, talk about our Houston Dynamo. Leave that down here too. We'll get into that. We'll talk a little Dynamo. I can talk he footy. Can, he can, Spence loves some footy, bro. I love bro. footy. So, but yeah, guys, this has been Athletically Declined on ESPN 97.5. Y'all take it easy.